All right, welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Today on the show, we have uh, Lee, Lee uh, Wel- Walter, which is an activist here in Sacramento. We also have uh, James Just, who is the vice chair for the uh, Sacramento LP. First thing on our uh, topic today, we're going to be talking about the Hong Kong protests. What are you guys' thoughts on that? You guys been paying attention to the Hong Kong protests? Yeah, but I, I already knew a little bit about what's going on there, that... Uh, Commies are dictators, <laughs> and, and they have yeah. a, they have a bad record. Yeah. And what they're attempting to do is to force the Hong Kong government to turn over anybody who's on the bad side of the the mainland commies and send them to prison or execution mm-hmm. or torture or whatever happens there. And people in Hong Kong aren't happy with that prospect. Uh, yeah, and, and, so. and I, th- I think the Hong Kong uh, w- w- was under oh, the common rule or something like that when it was given up by England. Yeah, it was given to British. It was the British used to control Hong Kong, and then they gave it back to uh, China. What in the year two thousand? But it was like a ninety-nine year law. They had to wait yeah, ninety-nine yeah. years before they can actually officially take it back. Yeah, over. it was like fifty years, but they waited ten before they've already started <laughs> taking, which the, we all knew was going to happen. And yeah. you know, it was the beauty of it is that. Um, according to my view of the history, is that at one point, Hong Kong was like the tenements and public housing of Detroit, or maybe New Orleans or Baltimore or a place like that. It was a mess, but they were giving a rel- high relative uh, degree of freedom, and they made the best of it. I made a visit there, and uh, uh, one morning after, while I was jogging, I thought, oh, I'm starting to get hungry. There are two young girls. They couldn't have been more than 14 years old with a camp stove in a big pot, and they were cooking wonton, wonton soup. And they were serving it in little paper cones and wooden chopsticks and for something hmm. like 15 cents. I had a good, <laughs> tasty breakfast. A purely capitalist society, right? Well, I don't know, if it, was, I don't know yeah. if it was Hong Kong or Singapore, but someone once told me, he says, we lost, when you lose your job, what you do is you figure out what you're going to sell until you get your new, new, new job. So you, you open up a shop on a store and you sell T-shirts or whatever until you actually find your well, new job. Well, I think job. That, that's, that's where most countries are, except for the U.S. Here, here in the U.S., you know, it's, it's, it's go sign up the welfare line, but I think in, in most, uh, in, in not just third world countries, but in most parts of the world and a lot of, uh, first world countries that that's what it is the idea is just sell sell until you find your next job when when I made that visit to Hong Kong I spoke with the custom tailor and my wife and I commented that uh, Hong Kong was <laughs> being right next to the waterfront I said it's sort of like San Francisco except it's a lot more courteous and it doesn't smell as bad and, <laughs> and, 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 well, well, why aren't there beggars on the street? He says, oh, no, we have a way to help people who are hungry and can't afford a meal. They're given from the welfare office or benefits office, whatever you call it, they're given a broom and a dustpan and a section of street. If the section of street is clean at the end of the day, they get enough money to buy a meal. If it's not clean enough at the end of the day, they come back the next day a little bit hungrier and do a better job. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call job opportunities. There you go. There you go. Yeah, it, well, there's, there's more than one way to handle these, these situations. I mean, we have, here in California, we like to hand free stuff out rather than actually deal with the underlying issues that are preventing people from taking care of themselves. Well, I think that even circles back to was the, uh, the Denmark, how all the socialists like to praise Denmark for having a, a socialist society when it's actually not even really socialist. They're very capitalist. And, even their welfare system is a lot more capitalistic uh, in nature. Uh, it's, it's really more of a training program, and, and, it, and it's about getting you back into the workforce, not just sustaining you, but getting you back into the workforce. So they're, to say that they're, uh, they're a socialist country because they have a better welfare system than us is, is a complete, complete lie. I mean, they, they're a better country, they're, they have a better welfare system, a beca- a system than us because they're more capitalist than we are. Well, any of these small countries that have a homogeneous, uh, butcher this word, homogeneous society, mm-hmm. is gonna, are going to have an easier time with the welfare state than they are with a country like the United States, where we are so diverse, economically and culturally diverse, wherever you go, that makes the, the complications so much more difficult. Absolutely. So you're not going to be able to. And when you go back to Hong Kong, 
It's you've got Hong Kong as a free society trying to be be forced into a an oppressive society in, in the communist society of China, and it's now there's nowhere it's going to go. They're going to end up getting folded into China. There's just nothing anybody else can do. So we can they can protest all we want, but eventually it's going to turn bad. There was one program. I congratulate John Stossel for his excellent history of libertarian thinking and exposition. He talked mm -hmm. about how long it took to get a business permit in uh, certain yes, countries. I that episode. Mm -hmm. He says, and I walked into the office in Hong Kong two hours later. I was a business owner. It's as simple as that. Good for him. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to uh, uh, start bringing weapons to, to, over Hong Kong because uh, I think right now they're also fighting for their Second Amendment right. You see a lot of the pro protesters are at calling out for their Second Amendment right. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're watching our slogans that give me liberty or give me death and and those kind of the old, the old slogans that we used to live by here in the United States are kind of ex showing up over there. It, it, yeah, exactly. And, and now what we're doing is we're getting rid of them. And, and you guys hear about how over in uh, San Francisco, the uh, 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 board of supervisors just just declared the NRA as a terrorist organization. Well, that's why we I, we put out these declarations. What's uh, National Gun Owners Association is one, and plastic straws. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we are now criminals in California. <laughs> we're criminals. Yes, yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, we're not a we're not a sit down restaurant, and you know, so I guess yeah, maybe it's okay. Yeah, actually, my my roommate uh, uh, is a manager at a restaurant, and uh, he says that you, as a waiter, can be fined uh, and actually sued uh, for giving someone a straw unless they ask for it. And, and I think it was, it was I don't remember the exact number, but it was an outrageous amount that you'll immediately be fined. Way more than the average waiter a waiter makes makes as a salary, a significant amount. I can't remember the exact number. I don't want to uh, say say a number and I had to be wrong, but I know it was a it was an outrageous amount. It was. It doesn't sound like something that would go on in a free society, does it? Is well, this uh, is this Venezuela? And why is it we're, we're punishing the, the the waiters and waitresses that, that are work, working hard to help people? Why is it they get punished for giving someone a straw? It's not even it's not even the business that gets in trouble. It's it's the waiter and waitresses that get. I mean, I think the business the business also sustains a fine, but it's both the wait, the waiter or waitress who, who handed out the straw and the business that get fined. Well, we're criminalizing political opposition. Essentially, if you go back to the NRA or even the straws, you're, <laughs> you're pen penalizing people who disagree with your way of life. We're, we're turning them into criminals or terrorists or dehumanizing them or whatever phrase you want to actually use. We're, we're doing all of it. Here in my supposition, if you are opposed to the democratic socialist uh, program, you are racist, racist, <laughs> racist. That, and, and how do you defend yourself against that? That's what is that? That's a form of McCarthyism. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, good point. Well, they've gone from racists. Now they're going to call you terrorist. Now, it, it, we've, they're already they're telling you where where they're going. Yeah, it, it's, this is the oldest book and you know oldest scheme in the book is it, it, McCarthyism. Before that, it was uh, the Salem witch trials, uh, and, and it was simple as just calling someone a, you're a communist, you're a commie, you're a commie. And, and it wasn't really much of a defense to that. It was like, oh no, I just had these views and stuff. Well, no, you're you're communist if you had those views. And and so it's it's ironic how that was the conservative uh, thing thing that conservatives used to do to attack the left. But now the left is using that same tactic against the right uh, yeah, and conservatives. But it's okay to be a communist in in America. You're allowed to be a communist. You're allowed to advocate for that position. What you're not allowed to do is to be uncivil in that advocation. Exactly. And so as long as you're civil, I don't care what you are, you can be civil and advocate for your position. That is the whole basis of freedom. And we seem to have forgotten that. But decades ago, there was a, a German, what was his name, Schekel Gruber, something to that effect? Uh, sounds familiar. I, I, yeah, he took up the name Adolf. And, <laughs> and, and he, he persuaded people that if they registered all the firearms, it would be a more harmonious and peaceful and safe society. The people that believed him. They even did, welcomed him to join uh, Austria with Germany to <laughs> make life wonderful for well, us. Well, as a Jew, I'm never going to give up my firearms again. <laughs> yeah. Well, this notion of the common good, we're going we're to declare the NRA a terrorist organization for the common good. Or whatever it is, for the you know, we're going to give up our body autonomy for for vaccinations for the common good. Well, the common good isn't a very valid argument considering how many tragedies, human tragedies, have been made in the name of the common good. It's <laughs> yeah. it's a 
It's an invalid argument. I'm, I'm curious as to, as to is, is it, it only the organization itself, or if I go there with an NRA sticker, will I also be viewed as a terrorist? Try and find out. <laughs> Try and find out. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're part of the NRA, then I suppose you are a terrorist. You can't, if you're part of the NRA, if you're part of a terrorist organization, you are therefore a terrorist, right? Yeah. And so if you are a member. It's quite a stretch. I just, I just, it just feels, it's, maybe it's because I'm from Ella County and, and the politics is a little, little bit more conservative where I'm from, but it just feels like it's such a stretch to have an NRA bumper sticker and then have it get pulled over by, by the uh, uh, San Francisco Police Department and then go to jail for terrorist activities. I, I feel... Let's look back just a few decades, not even a, a few years, not even a decade or so. We had a president who was really buddies with the Muslim brother, Brotherhood. Look at the people he put into his cabinet and, and gave awards to and funded cash to and well I mean we always have a lot of uh, people in, in, in our government that have been fr friends with uh, people who you know ISIS and, and Muslim brotherhoods you know it's uh, starting to become a, more of a common trend with that wonder there were times when you wonder is this terrorist group are there our allies or enemies mm -hmm. depends on which day or which week you're talking about. Yeah, depends which policy they want you want supported yeah. <laughs> that particular year. It's <laughs> you know, it it changes so much. You know, one minute we're arguing with the Taliban and next minute we're we're fighting the Taliban and now we're actually in Afghanistan discussion with the Taliban about how you can rule this part of the country, it's fine as long as you don't do I forget what it is. I don't do X. And you can go ahead and take care of that part of the country. And you're going, well wait a minute, we just fought a war for what, twenty years in Afghanistan now. Well, 19 years? What is, was it? 18. Yeah. 2001. So, something like that. It's been, it's been a long time, almost 20 years, 17, 18 years in Afghanistan, and now we're just going to go and hand it right back, which maybe we should have done it 10 years ago or whatever, but... In some, it, some parts of the Middle East, it seems to me that one tribe has been fighting another tribe. Yeah, that, that's exact. For, for centuries. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's, why, you're voting for your favorite warlord. Metal. Exactly. I, I have a, had a friend who is from uh, Afghanistan, and I remember I'd ask him about the politics over there. And, and they don't have a political party system like we do. What they have is a warlord <laughs> system. Which warlord do you think is not going to uh, rob you the most or, or yeah. beat up your family? And, and, and there was, there's actually no way of getting. It's just like how we complain about having a top two and how everyone's brainwashed. It's the same concept with the warlords. Is everyone knows that they're voting for a warlord who's going to essentially hurt them, but they don't want the other warlord to have the power. So they're more afraid of one lord, war, warlord over the other. So it's like our politics. <laughs> yeah, and actually, they have because they have different languages. Um, one of the common arguments is is when you come to tell someone, explain to them. Uh, wh why they shouldn't vote for a certain warlord? They simply just go, oh, "You're not speaking my language," and they'll switch languages. Because <laughs> you got Farsi, and in certain certain areas, you have Arabic, and other areas, so you have lots of different languages. And so, uh, yeah. and so even though everyone speaks all, all common languages and stuff, people will then all of a sudden stop speaking the language yeah. once you start showing them. The, the <laughs> all of a sudden, I don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Tribalism, <laughs> divisiveness. In fact, don't we have politicians who are promoting divisiveness? They pander to one group and then cater to another group and make promises that... Yeah, promise and fear. That is essentially the politician's stock and trade. We will yeah. protect you from these other evil people. Yes. Yeah. No matter who they are. Yeah. Fear those guys and we promise to spend money to, you know, give you candy or whatever they're going to promise this week. I, I was watching the Democrat... Uh, part of the Democrat debate the other day, and they're promising free stuff to everything. It's free, you know, free, stuff. free, free, free. Yeah, yeah, free stuff. It's like, well, no, nothing is free. It's some maybe, maybe you can make an argument that government should provide service X and Y and Z, but it's not free. <laughs> well, spe speaking of the of the uh, Democratic candidates, which which are your favorites and least favorites, or which ones are you would you say are the most pro or least pro uh, gun? Guys, how many names you I'm want not, to bring up, sure or about, do you think it's even I'm worth the conversation? Sure, I'm not <laughs> sure about guns, but I know from the 2016 campaign, my favorite brief scenario was video recorded, and uh, Bernie Sanders was saying, we're going to get free this, free that, free something else, and free yet another thing. Somebody asked, how are all these free things going to be paid for? He said, it's easy. He says, the government's going to pay for it. I thought, 
who are the government? <laughs> well, it's, it, yeah, I and mean, the, the argument is bringing taxes uh, up to 90%. Um, that was argument, and that's common argument. I always see this argument is that because way back in the 50s or, or, or whatever, not we used to have a, a uh, 90% t- tax income bracket, right? But at the time that was, that was in effect, there was only one person in the whole world that it applied to. Yeah. And he was the one that wrote the law. Yes. And he didn't pay any taxes. <laughs> no, because no, no. if you make that much money, you can you know design who? the way your, your income comes in, and so you don't pay the taxes. You know who it was? No, I forget. Rock Actually, Rockefeller. I do know. I should know this, That's but I don't. It was Rockefeller. The tax code is 57,000 pages long, and there are people probably help make it that complicated and lengthy so they can be expert consultants to, to to help people avoid it. Well, here, here's the truth when it comes to taxes, and, and, and you can do this homework on your own. Is you can get we can do is you can go to the, uh, I think it's the uh, Census Bureau. You can get this information, and you can get the uh, amount of revenue collected each year, tax revenue collected by the U.S. government since 1950. I think it goes all the way back to 1950. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can take the uh, U.S. GDP all the way back to 1950. And you can get that from just by any website. There's a lot of websites that have that information. Get the GDP. Uh, get get the amount of tax revenue. And you'll find that no matter what the taxes were, no matter if they're high, low, if a Republican was in office or a Democrat was in office, it doesn't matter who, who was controlling the government or how the government was, we, we always uh, somehow maintain around 17% of GDP as far mm. as tax, tax uh, revenue collected. Sometimes it peaked up as high as late 18% and dropped down as low as 16%. But for the most part, it always hovered around 17% of GDP. Uh, and the reason for that is because the, even as you raise taxes, it shrinks the economy. So even though you're taking more money out of it, it shrinks the economy. And as you lower taxes, the economy grows. So, so no matter what, you're, you're, it, it actually equals out. You're only going to be able to get about 17% of GDP. Thus, uh, Donald Trump as president uh, decreased taxes and for more investment, more productivity, uh, more economic benefits, but the next step is to trim back government, which is yeah. <laughs> a real burden. And, and a big part of that, one of the biggest taxations is hidden, uh, obscure, obfuscated for most people, which is the Federal Reserve System. Yeah, one of the it's biggest siphon- taxes ever. It's, it's, it's siphoned off 98% of the Dollars value to tax on your savings. Nineteen thirteen. Yeah, I mean, pe- people uh, are always concerned about wages, but no one ever concerns about the value of, of the dollar and how much that dollar is worth. Uh, what 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 is a hundred dollars today is not a hundred dollars uh, ten years from now. You're right. Yes. <laughs> no, especially if you're buying like land or or something that's been completely manipulated by by politicians. I mean, property values are. They're so manipulated nowadays that there's the, the market no longer is real. You have a house that may, it says, you, says it's worth $500,000, but is it? Why is it worth $500,000? Is it because you know, there's generally that many people who want to pay that much money, or is it because there's you know, not enough housing, so therefore the price has been artificially increased? Or because they've used the Fed or other mechanisms to funnel a bunch of money into the system, so therefore there's more money floating around in the system so people can buy a house that they can't really afford, like we did back in 2008, where people were buying houses they couldn't afford because there was a bunch of money floating around the system, and then all of a sudden that money gets shut off and the whole system collapses. And so when you manipulate this, the housing market, it affects absolutely everything, and now we've got... And even when the housing market is, is being manipulated, it's still uh, uh, one of the safer ways, safer places to put your money because holding on to it and it's just saving it has a, has a higher risk than, than just putting it into the housing. Uh, so I, I, if you look at all the billionaires and all the multimillionaires and what, what they're doing, whatever the ho- even when the housing uh, was at its worst, where were they putting their money? They were putting it into, into, into real estate. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that is because everything else is already uh, far worse than, than real estate. Yeah, but if you buy, let's say, my, my, the house I live in is paid for. It's a family house. The family owns it. It's, it's already paid for. So essentially, we could sell it and walk away. But we couldn't even buy it back without have, making our economic conditions worse. I'd, have to, I'd literally have to leave California or buy someplace smaller in, yeah. a worse, in a worse area to have the same living standards that I have now. So rather than using our houses as an economic investment, we should be use, we should be com, we should be trying to get people to use them as a long-term 
family safety net. My house was there to catch the family members when we fell down and we needed some place to go. The house was there. The resale value is irrelevant. The resale value means nothing to any of us. Whether it's worth $400,000 or $100,000 is still a dwelling. Is completely <laughs> irrelevant. What's relevant is that yeah, you're it's, always there, need a place to stay. it's there for us. It's there for me when I needed it. It was there for my son when he needed some place to raise his to, to raise his, his baby. And it was there for me when my family fell apart and I needed some place to go and rebuild my life. And that is something that we don't even discuss anymore. We discuss family uh, housing is, is complete as an economic investment. It's, it's how much can you buy it for and how much can you sell it for and, and not, not how much can you create a family safety net I instead learned, of instead of a social safety net. I learned about political manipulations uh, many decades ago close to six decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather uh, had a real estate business. He was a land developer. And at a time after the uh, Great Depression, or in the, the, the Great Depression was resolving, he was selling bid building lots. People were afraid that they were going to buy something and it was going to turn out to not be worth what they were paying. So he had a brilliant idea. He said, if you're not happy with this, I will buy it back from you for the same price you paid. <laughs> he had to be, right? And of course then people bought the lots and built their homes on it and he said, you're going to need an elementary school in your neighborhood. This property goes to the school district to build a school. and. Uh, worked out pretty well for him, but there was one, one uh, opportunity that did not work. He had been working from an office that was in a real shack of a building in a key intersection, and he thought, I don't really need this shack of an office anymore. It would be a good site to build a multiple residence dwelling, like uh, uh, eight unit apartment mm -hmm. building. He needed to get permission, to get it rezoned. Just wasn't going to happen. So the, the the developer who was eager to build the apartment building sort of dropped out of the picture, and my grandfather sold it to somebody who sort of lowballed the whole deal. Within a few weeks, that purchaser, whose uncle was on the city council, got the <laughs> rezoning done. <laughs> <laughs> they, built, they built a multiple residence yeah, dwelling. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's not whether the, you know, that zoning is reasonable. It's who do you know that can get the zoning changed? Uh, or why is it even zoned that way? We have an issue in our neighborhood now where they want to go down Stockton Boulevard and close all the, well, they actually say they don't say they want to close. They want to prevent new auto shops from opening and eventually push out the ones that are there so they can replace them with housing. But they're not building housing there now. There's already plenty of empty lots where they can build housing. So it's got nothing to do with housing. It's, yeah, it's the one- like starting the, the auto business. No, they want to change our neighborhood to make it like Midtown, essentially is what they want to do. They want to force Oak Park to change and to be more like Midtown because for them, Midtown's a success. And so they want to recreate Midtown in Oak Park. And they're going to lie and cheat and steal to do it. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that sounds pretty similar to what, what's going on in uh, L.A. County. Um, you know, but the only issue is, is that uh, there's, what do, you, what, do you call, what do you call them, the um, uh, not in my backyard people? Yes, the oh, NIMBYs. Plenty of those. NIMBYs. <laughs> so you, you have a lot of those people who will not allow any form of development whatsoever. Uh, and it's because they fear just, uh, you know, housing development, which I understand. But you, need, you have to have economic development, too. Uh, so Ella County, everyone lives in Ella County, but no one works in Ella County unless you work for the government. Uh, you can work for the Ella County government, but other than that, you, you work, chances are you work in Sacramento County, uh, but live in Ella County. But th 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 there's uh, all those, those all those new houses that were built built up in uh, Folsom uh, was it Folsom Ranch? Mm -hmm. uh, all bought before they're even done being built. Every single one of those houses is sold. I mean. Right away, I, I think they're being resold, of course, but you know they were all bought one, one way or another uh, before they're even done being built. So, so I mean, there, there's a couple of different different uh, issues right there with, with just getting this to happen. There's a lot of people just political push or prevention from from that even happening. Well, what's funny is that that whole Folsom Ranch was 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 thought of, uh, got approval, and has been built while the rail yards down here in Sacramento are still sitting there empty. 
<laughs> they laid down the streets. The streets are laid down, uh, but they're, they're still not building because the city gave it to a developer. The developer had problems, and so now we all sit and wait, and housing doesn't get built. <laughs> I mean, this is what happens when we have too much centralized control, too much mm -hmm. government or people with other agendas sitting there poking around and saying, this is going to get built by this guy, this is going to get built by this person, this is going to get built by this person, rather than just saying, let's parcel it out to small and medium developers and let it build organically like, you know, neighborhoods used to be built. Or if the employers realize they could, they could move to a less densely populated area and attract um, employees to the affordability of not being in a dense city well, where you can't even, can't even afford to park your car. In fact, yeah. I have a family member whose job took him to New York City, he realized having a garage and parking his personal vehicle would cost more than the lease payments for the vehicle. <laughs> so, so he persuaded his sister to take over the car and make the lease payments and he learned to get around with uh, taxis and public transit and Uber. Like yeah. Uber. Oh yeah, he lives in San Francisco now and he's, it's amazing. He gets a call and within two minutes, he says, oh yeah, it's the, the white uh, Subaru that's just rolling up here and it's license number and... Yeah, well that's going to be gone here in California too, so Uber's going to be toast. You think so? AB5 is going to toast Uber, yeah. AB5 is going to toast Uber and Lyft. Now it may the rest of the gig economy may actually survive it, but Uber and Lyft, I would oh, doubt they're going to survive so it. Some of this is a matter of um, paying off the uh, the taxi people for their camp political. Yeah, it, it's it, well, it's all coming. the The support for AB five came from uh, unions. Unions think they're somehow going to get you know people out of this union members out of this whole deal, but none of us want to be union members. Well, so that, I, I thought they're trying to unionize Uber and, and, and Lyft and all those companies. Yeah, they are, but no one wants to be. I mean, there's a handful of people who may want to, but the ma vast majority of people who work in the gig economy do it for the freedom. They don't want the controls. They don't want this, the, the thing that, that comes with you know, union and, and all that kind of things. There is a counterpoint to that. I recall reading that uh, a county in uh, southern uh, Gulf Coast, Florida, may have been Naples or thereabouts, was considering... That's it for the show, guys. Oh, wonderful. We'll, we'll <laughs> talk about this again soon. That's terrific. <laughs>